and action. Welcome back to Show and Tell, everyone. I'm Billy, and today I'm going to be joined by a special guest. I'm going to let her introduce herself. I'm in New York. She's going to tell you where she's dialing in from. And she's also going to share with all of us some of her vast collection of vintage hand knits. I'll be right back. Okay, here we are. I am going to let my guest introduce herself so I don't bungle her name. <laughs> and I'm also going to ask her to tell us where she's from. Hi everybody, my name is Jessie and I am from Southern California. And I currently live in the city of Anaheim, which is famous because that's where Disneyland is. I was going to ask you besides Disneyland, because I, of course I've been there and I'm familiar with Anaheim a little bit, but I was going to ask you for people who haven't been there or who have and who would like to come back, is there something other than Disneyland that you would recommend people see in your, in your town? Because we don't know it. You know, there is a little old Anaheim downtown area, um, and it's really cute, and it has lots of nice bars and restaurants and stores. It's a really lovely little place to do some walking around. There's a, a really nice museum there. Um, we also have the Bowers Museum, which is nearby, so a nice, it's a small but really high-class art museum that's local here. Uh, I love How it. do you spell that? Uh, Bowers Museum. It's B O W E R apostrophe S. Bowers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you find yourself in Anaheim and you want to take a break from Disneyland, that's the place to go. I think. And any local yarn shops? You know, and not in Anaheim so much. Unfortunately. Nope. Yeah. I do a lot of my yarn shopping online. During this pandemic, I think many of us have. Okay. So. I know that we had a little bit of a dialogue about STEM. You already know that I'm an engineer, well, retired, <laughs> quickly retired after eight years of engineering, but I'm not at all familiar with what your relationship to STEM is, so why don't you go ahead and tell us? Is it science? Is it math? Is it tech? I'm a science girl. Um, I went to graduate school actually for paleontology, so, I study fossils. I study dinosaurs and fossil birds. Um, yeah. Hence the birds on your sweater. Hence the birds on my sweater. Exactly. I'm doing a bird sweater also, but it's not, it's not these. It's not swallows. Mine are more like parakeets. I was just looking at yours on Ravelry, actually. Uh, it's coming out beautiful. Gosh, that looks so challenging, though. <laughs> Especially if you don't do a lot of color work, which I really hadn't done color work in... A quarter of a century yeah and it was never my strong suit yeah the other day I was listening to rocks rocks do you know Roxanne Richardson oh I don't no she's a master knitter. Knitter, no. oh she's she's incredible she has a podcast and she does a lot of tutorials but I heard her say that color work is not her forte she really prefers texture and I'm thinking that I'm probably in that camp too I, I'm enjoying doing lace a lot um, yeah I mean I, I do cables and I do color work I, I can but I think my preference is more lace maybe it seems more vintage to me I don't know in an upcoming episode I'm going to show some a, a, a large collection of vintage sweaters and there isn't so much color work, but there's interesting dynamics with color, like two-tone and three-tone things. So stay tuned, everybody, for that. Anyway, so uh, paleontology. I, I lied a little bit, a white lie, because I did sort of know something along those lines. So pop quiz. <laughs> oh, it's called a furcula, uh, anatomically speaking. Um, which is the fancy name for the wishbone of a bird. And what, 
type of bird do you think this is from? Oh gosh. Um, Wait, let, that's not fair. Let me pull out my vintage tape measure and give you some dimensions because it could be from any kind of bird, right? Okay, it's about two and a quarter. Yeah, about two and a quarter inches in length. And the width, and I should have calipers to do this, right? <laughs> um, the width is about one and a half at its widest point. That's still honestly pretty challenging. I would guess based on the size, perhaps chicken and also the availability. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And a small chicken at that, because as I've mentioned in previous episodes, I live in a tiny apartment. So everything I do seems to be cozy and small. Even <laughs> chickens tend to be small in this home, especially because we don't really eat too, too much chicken anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Three of us are mostly veggie. Here's one that's even smaller. Oh, wow. So I've, I've had these in my kitchen because when our son was young, this one's even smaller, um, I used to break, make a wish and break wishbones with him, and I still have some left over. He's oh, 26 now, I although I think, it would still, I think it would still play in Poughkeepsie. He's game. <laughs> okay, so I really should have done with you that thing they used to do on television. I don't know. You're too young to remember the game show, What's My Line? But people would come on <laughs> and they would sign in on this blackboard. And then there were these panelists who would try and guess the profession of that person. So, you know, if, we, if it was a very feminine, dainty woman, people wouldn't guess that she was a wrestler, <laughs> a lady wrestler. Um, I think people would have a really hard time guessing your profession. <laughs> so I'm glad that you shared that with us. And it pertains evidently to your knitting. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Okay, so let's, let's get into seeing some of your sweaters because I know that there's some real beauties. Yeah, well today I uh, picked out some of my favorite sweaters that I've made. Um, I don't actually own any authentic vintage knitwear. Um, I, I don't know. I just haven't been a lot of places where I've looked for it. Uh, but I also, I'm addicted to knitting. I love it. So I love making Join the club, knitting. girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I'm going to share today are all garments I've made from actual vintage patterns. Um, so the one that I'm wearing is called the Swallows Jumper and... It's from a 1940s pattern that I stumbled across for free on Ravelry. When I first started knitting about five years ago and I fell in love with it and I was too intimidated to try it because I was a beginner. Um, so uh, about five years later, um, I finally did this project and I was especially excited to do it because as you now know, Birds are meaningful to me. I study fossil birds, I study living birds. Um, so I thought it was so cute and fun to have a sweater with some birds on it. Um, and I, I love it. Um, so it's a pattern from the 1940s, in case I didn't say that already. Um, it has, you were talking about texture and how that can be fun to play with. What I love about it, even though it's really difficult to see right now because of the light on me, is it plays with texture in a fun way. So it has a very, very long ribbed section. It goes from the bottom all the way up to mid bust on me. Um, and then from here to here, there's actually a section of pearl um, and it's kind of chevron shaped pearls. Uh, and then it switches to stockinette up here for the color work part. Um, so maybe I'll send you a photo of the uh, I was just model, gonna ask the you. original version and then you can see it better or even a close up of yours, because I can incorporate that. That would be great to see, because it's blowing mm -hmm. out because totally of the washed out, of yeah. it. But it sound, that sounds really great. And if, if you saw my episode on sequins, I think if somebody wanted to do those birds with a little touch of sequin, 
you know, not too much, just a little bit of extra flash that could be really spectacular or even sequins inside of these. Are they little diamond shapes? Yeah, that's such a great idea. They're little diamonds. And there's, there's one tiny red stitch in the middle of each diamond. And uh, like yourself, color work is not my strong suit or my favorite thing. <laughs> so I tried my very best to keep my tension loose, but the little little red stitch in the center of each of the diamonds got kind of washed out. So I love the idea of the sequin. I think that's mm -hmm. really great. It's smashing. Now tell us your tips or your tricks for getting such a good fit because I'm betting dollars to donuts that the pattern was not in your size. Was it for one size only? It was one size only. Not it your was, size. It was not exactly. I was lucky this time. I believe it was a 36 inch bust and I'm more of a 38. Um, so I have at this point in my knitting career made so many garments for myself that I have a really good idea, especially when I'm doing something vintage. I always, I do so many things with fingering weight yarn and size two, size one needles. So I just know um, if I look at the cast on, how many stitches to cast on, if that's going to fit me or not. And I can compare it to what I cast on for other similar projects where I like the fit. And then I, I, um, yeah, it's just something I've, it's, it's experience that allowed me to modify it as I went. So I think because the bottom's ribbing, I could stick with the original because ribbing's quite forgiving and stretchy. And then I you doing increases for the bust. That's what I was going to ask you. You're doing some kind of waist shaping and then you're increasing at the bust. And because you've done it before, you just know when it gets to the bust, how many stitches you need in that area. Yeah. Usually and what I'll do is I'll look at an older project with a fit similar to what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. And I'll see, okay, increase to, you know, X number of stitches on the bust for that sweater. So that's what I'm going to aim for, for this sweater. And the sleeves also fit perfectly that that also is um just an experience also it, it was trial and error plus experience so the sleeve this was really fascinating construction something i had never done before the sleeve and did i do this on the collar i think the collar too um, the sleeve did not start with ribbing um, it was maybe an inch of just plain white stockinette and then you do the color work and then you create a hem by folding the outer band of white inside and then you knit those together for the next stitch so between the double fold which is really a three ply fabric now because you have the layer of color work with, with all the uh right all the um floats that you're carrying right. and then you have that stocking net so the first time i I did that not even close to fitting my arm. I have bigger arms too. So I had to rip the whole thing out and I went back. I know <laughs> it was sad. Ripping out the color work is not uh, joyous. It's not, it is not. I'm just lucky it was a little, little patch of it. Um, but I ripped it out and then I had to go back and add an additional three pattern repeats. Um, wow. And then from there it was okay. But once again, even after I got this part fitting correctly, um, I went back to another sweater I had finished where the sleeve fit really nicely and I followed that because I knew I wanted for this particular sweater I just wanted kind of zero ease or a little bit of positive ease. In one of my prior episodes, actually in two, the episode where I showed my Aunt Matilda's three dresses there was always that turned under hem. And then in my own vintage sweater, my 1940s cardigan that I did a whole episode on, the instructions called for that hem. And because I knew about that, I did it in a, a contemporary sweater that has a vintage feel. It, for anybody watching this, it just makes a really nice edge. It gives body and substance so that it's not hanging like noodles it gives it a really crisp edge i've seen some of my grandmother's clothing my grandmother was quite heavy and for fancy occasions she had some custom-made clothing they put little metal discs in certain areas of the dress to 
hold it down, like particularly in the hem, but I think in some other areas too, to hold it in place and give it a certain kind of structure so that it's not just flapping in the wind. These were like satin dresses that had, you know, some substance to them. So anyway, that's, I think it's a hallmark. I mean, in my limited experience, I'm gaining more experience all the time. I think it's a hallmark of many vintage patterns. They were so well made. And the patterns today, it's just like, you know, make a rectangle, bind off, uh, stitch down the side, voila, you have a sweater. These things are so much more interesting. And the challenge, I mean, I think we're not the only people who are STEM people in the knitting, in the knitting world. And often when I hear people say, you know, they're mathematician or um, they're working on their PhD in statistics or computational biology, it's because we have that kind of mindset. We're up for the challenge. We're not intimidated. It's fascinating to us. So no surprise, no surprise. Of course, I don't mean to insult anybody who's a high school dropout because, hey, if you can follow the pattern, you can you know, make a recipe, it's the same thing. Just follow it to the letter and you're gonna get great product. Okay, so yes, I, I'm really looking forward to getting a close up of this because it looks stunning, stunning, stunning. Tell us about the yarn though, because I'm always challenged when I want to do something vintage with, there's so much indie dyed yarn out there that doesn't really lend itself to a really classic vintage look. What kind of yarn did you use here? And is it vintage yarn or did you find um, modern things that work for you? It's, it's not a vintage yarn. I have um, very strong yarn loyalty, I guess. I just have like very, very few brands I usually buy from because I find one and I just, I fall in love with it and I become obsessed with it. So my most recent obsession is yarn from Quince & Co. Mm -hmm. um, I really love supporting them because they have high quality yarns, but they're also as much as possible American made, which is nice to support for the yarn industry. Um, so this is all made from um, their line of just plain fingering yarn, which I'm totally forgetting. This one, they named them all after birds. This one might be, no, it's not Sparrow. I forget which one this is right now. But you can send a, it to me and I'll put it on yeah. the screen. Yeah, it's a, it's a Quince & Co fingering yarn. Um, they just, it's their, they make it in lots of different colors for color work. So I loved the color selection. Um, it's great for color work, but it's also, it feels beautiful. It's really, really wonderful quality. And um, I've done several sweaters with it now, uh, vintage sweaters. And in my opinion, at least, um, it works beautifully for vintage product or product. Is, is it Merino or some other? What well, is it? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Well, once we get the name, we can look yeah. it up. We can look okay. up what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, what else you got? Oh, real quick before we move on to the what else. I also wanted to share, so aside from making vintage sweaters and cardigans, I love collecting vintage pins and brooches. Uh, so I have, I'm wearing my feather pin. Oh, so that's the bird theme. I'm wearing a feather too. Uh -huh. Sort of. <gasps> <laughs> beautiful feather. <laughs> You're the big feather. <laughs> so I have my feather there. So and we next, didn't plan that. We did not coordinate Yeah, that. we didn't coordinate our, our pins. Uh, the next thing I picked to share oh, was yes. this. It's called the Trimmed with Roses Cardigan and Jumper. And it's a twin set pattern. Mm -hmm. um, this is from uh, Susan Crawford's A Stitch in Time. And actually... Everything else I'm showing today is from there. I love it because she shows, she provides vintage patterns from many different eras. Um, and then she has gone through the work of uh, making them available in different sizes, which is so great for someone who is not tiny and petite and fits most vintage patterns. This um, book is out of print now, isn't it? It might be, but 
I have personally, I just use a PDF version and I'm almost certain that you can still purchase the, the digital PDF version of it. Of the whole book? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. That's how I own it. Actually. I don't have a hard copy even. Ah. Um, and I, I love a good twin set. So, and roses, how can you pass up roses? Right? So this is my, my trimmed with roses twin set. Um, I have adorned it with another vintage pin, a rose pin, of course, which is especially nice for me because uh, this actually belonged to my grandmother. Was uh, her name Rose? It was not, but that would have been very appropriate. My grandmother's name was Rose. Her name and my mother's name was Pearl. Oh. So I am the recipient of many, 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 many pearls. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love, love them. It. I love them all. That's They're all awesome. like, I guess if you have many children, you love them equally. I love uh -huh. all of my mother's pearls with the same uh -huh. affection. So okay, her <laughs> name wasn't Rose. Um, can we see the inside sweater? Because I don't yeah. know if it's sleeveless, short sleeve, long sleeve. It's short sleeve. This was the first ever twin set that I made. So there's the sweater. Adorable. I love it so much. Um, but I will share an important lesson I learned when making a twin set. Um, so a lot of times, as you'll know, Billy, these, uh, vintage, especially 19, well, this one's actually 1950s, uh, but 1950s, 1940s sweaters and cardigans often will have a puff sleeve. Um, so this pattern had a puff sleeve on the jumper and on the cardigan. Oh. Um, it doesn't really work great though, if you're trying to wear it as a proper twin set, right. um, it's kind of hard to get the jumper or the cardigan over the puff sleeves on the jumper. So I have to just like shove it down in there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it's not the end of the world by any means, but just in case anyone else is looking to make a vintage twin set, um, this one is super fun. The color work is actually not that hard. Um, so I, I highly recommend it, but yeah, don't do the inner layer of the garment with puff sleeves. <laughs> Now I see a little zipper action in the back. Yeah, it has a zipper instead of button closure, which was I thought was really interesting. But you didn't use a vintage zipper? It's not no. a metal zipper? I, oh, it's, no, no, it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you went nine and a half yards and you didn't go the extra distance? <laughs> Actually, I where's a good place to search for vintage zippers? Like Etsy? Does Etsy sell a lot of them? I really don't know, but I'm sure in New York, in the Garment Center, where they have all these trim shops, if you ever need one, ask me, and after this uh, quarantine is over, I can go into Midtown and hunt around for you. I, I'm sure that there are places that probably have dusty boxes in the corner of a warehouse somewhere with like old unwanted zippers that we would really like to have because they probably yeah. came in all the appropriate colors. Yeah. Anyway. I bet you're right. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to give you a 99. I'm going to give you an A instead of an A plus. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The next one is another from a stitch in time. Um, and this is a 1940s jumper. You see the whole thing? There we go. This was my first ever uh, Fair Isle project. And uh, so that was special, figuring out how to knit like this. And it took a lot of work and trial and error, but um, I'm really pleased with how it came out. It's part of a twin set. So uh, making the matching cardigan is one of my projects for later this year, I think. Um, I'm gonna finish that so I have both pieces. And I have a cute little bumblebee pin on this one. Cute. Beautiful. I mean, it looks like beautiful work and oh, a lot you. of work. Do you knit with both hands when you're doing Fair Isle? I have looked, I looked it up on YouTube to see how to do it. 
And sometimes I will put the effort into practicing it, but really just for a couple of hard part of a row. And then I go back to just, I, I really struggle with it. It's not a skill that I've developed. So I usually just use still my one finger um, and then just go through the laborious process of switching out the strands of yarn as I go. But. My other person who I admire and watch her tutorials is Suzanne Bryan. And I had mentioned in my very first episode that as a young child, I learned to knit throwing. Yeah. Then somebody grabbed me very early on. I don't even think I was five and a half yet. And they taught me Kynanamal. So I am able to do both. And Suzanne Bryan has a great tutorial where she shows you how to hold one color. I think it's the dominant color on the left hand and the other color on your right hand. And I sort of got the rhythm going. It, it's, wow. worth, it's worth doing that because if you can, it just goes so much faster. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. This is new inspiration for me to practice doing that, especially because I'll be doing the matching cardigan and there's a little bit of the color work. So it's a good opportunity to practice it. I would love to, uh, maybe you could share a link to that video, to that tutorial of hers. That would be fantastic. Will do. Will do. Oh, and then also this one, uh, it, it's so cute. It comes actually included in the pattern with instructions for making um, like hand knit little uh, shoulder pad inserts too. Um, I didn't do that myself, partly because I'm really broad shouldered, so I don't like shoulder pads. Uh, and also because I'm doing the cardigan to go over it and I want it to fit. Um, but if anyone is interested out there, uh, you can also do some shoulder pads to amp up the 1940s styling of this. Right, for someone like me, I have very, narrow shoulders and they kind of slope down they're not broad i could use a shoulder pad so that that's good i'm sure some patterns some old patterns must come with that i haven't seen it yet but i i just thought that was so cute uh the next one i wanted to share is not a sweater at all i thought you know since it's summer why not share a vintage summer garment that i've made um, so once again, this is from a stitch in time. It's hard to show you the whole thing because it there's not much to it. But oh. this is a 1930s beach halter top. Um, so here's the the neck band, and then this is the back. It has a a very deep back, um, and actually, when I made the the pattern, my version. I think originally it was supposed to end, I made it go up higher than it should have. It was really, really short little band around the back. Um, and it's just ribbing all the way around. So you just do a whole bunch of ribbing and then you cast off the back and rib the front and then you make this cute little neck band. And it's just so adorable to throw over my bathing suit when I'm heading to the beach with a pair of high-waisted shorts. I love it, it's so cute. I love it too. I love it too. And I'm reminded of a bra that I used to have. It must have belonged to my mother. The back straps came down and then there was some kind of rigging where it didn't hook where a bra strap normally would hook. It was maybe four or five inches below that, but there was some kind of intricate rigging on the side that enabled it to hook lower down. It wasn't a strapless bra, it, it had straps, but it was really designed for this, for backless dresses. Uh, it didn't really fit me, so I don't think I still have it, but that's... Uh, that would be perfect for this. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, they must be out there, maybe on eBay, backless bra. It probably exists. I think also I want to make another one of these and then just build up the back higher mm -hmm. so that I can wear it with a regular halter bra. Um, I love the colors. It's sort of like a dusty blue and a dusty teal. Very unusual. This is also Quince and Co? Uh, no, this one, so because it's a summer garment i wanted to use cotton yarn to make it just you know i can sweat in it and toss it in the washing machine and it's 
just cooler as well. Um, so this is comfy fingering yarn from um, Knit Picks. So they have a really nice, it's modal cotton. Um, and it's just a really nice. I've used, I've used that cotton. It has a little bit of acrylic or not, not acrylic, some stretchy thing, nylon or something, yes. just a little bit, maybe like 5%, but it just gives you enough so that it, the cotton doesn't sag. I'm exactly. like very anti-noodle, it seems. <laughs> you <laughs> like are, Chris. I know. <laughs> so it's, it looks maybe, it's a little noodly when it's not on my body, but uh, because the whole thing is basically just ribbing, um, it has a nice, nice, cute, snug fit. Um, yeah, but I love the cotton yarn. It's so soft and cool and just really great, nice to work with. I do know that yarn and it has a nice hand. Yeah, it does, it does, I like it. All right, the next one I picked is, I realized that I do, I think of myself as being drawn toward 1950s looks, but most of the things I've made are 1940s. So secretly, I love the 40s. Uh, so here's a 40s, 1940s cardigan. And it has it a cute vintage brooch with pearls. Um, and this one's fun because, uh, again, it's from A Stitch in Time, and it's called the Diagonal Rib Cardigan. Um, so there's it's big fat ribs with regions of pearls, but then the stockinette is itself um, almost kind of rib looking. It has a really interesting diagonal texture to the stitches. Um, just hold that whole thing right up to your camera. Block your face. Just put it right on up there so we can get a good close up. Yeah. Great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> good. So it's another. I love the stitch. Yeah, it was a beautiful stitch. And this one, yeah, it's a DK weight yarn, but I used a smaller needle, maybe size three or something. Um, so it made it uh, really dense and it gives it a lot of nice body. And I, I actually, I love playing around with different size needles for changing kind of the texture of the fabric. Um, so this one was just a very nice, nice dense fabric, very cozy, cute cardigan. Okay, a personal question. Do you swatch? I do a lot of the time. I can't, I don't always. Um, much of the time I swatch, it kind of depends on what the project is. Um, if it's just fingering weight yarn on size two needles and there's no color work and pattern is not that complex, then I, I don't always nowadays, just because I know how I knit and I know what will and won't work. But I do swatch much of the time, especially if I am doing color work. Um, so I would say I'm a 75% of the time swatcher. Okay. True confessions, you heard it here first, people. <laughs> I have a whole bag of swatches, actually, and I use them. Where actually is my, oh, here it is. I have a I keep them around as coasters. Oh. So this is my swatch on my desk as my coaster, which was actually uh, the swatch for the little halter top back when I did it a long time ago. Not that you can see that on that square of white fabric, but. And then the last one I wanted to share today is one of my most favorite things I've ever made. It is also from the 1940s. Um, and also from A Stitch in Time. And the pattern is called A Jacket for Weekend Sports. Actually, you know what? Let me zip this up, sorry. So it's a very adorable little jacket. Can you see that? I can, it's so sweet. I love it. It has this really big folded over ribbed collar. Um, the texture is really fun. Uh, there are these diagonal rows of pearls, so it kind of mixes it up a little bit. Um, it has two cute little pockets. There's one up here and one down there. I'm sorry, again, not vintage zippers. 
What's the inside of the pocket look like? So and isn't that a little warm for you in Southern California or is that for when you travel? Remember you know, that? <laughs> Remember that novel thing that we used to do? Travel? I know. Um, it once in a while will get cool enough for me to wear this here. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the pocket on the inside. So I had to knit another square of fabric. And then how did I attach it? Actually, I think it got, it's been, it was, it's years since I did this project. It's possible that the pocket, I think I just hand sewed it in afterwards. Um, so then it's, it's an actual little tiny functional pocket, which cool. is pretty cool. Um, but it almost, the whole thing kind of fits almost like a bomber jacket. The, the sleeves are kind of big and not baggy sounds kind of bad, but the sleeves are a bit bigger. They have, and looser, but it fits. It's so adorable. And then the finishing touch, now I'm going to mess up my hair, but it came with a pattern for this super cute little matching hood hat number. So it's so stinking cute. It has a little, oh wait, here we go, a little point. Oh my, my goodness. Hair. My hair is not meant for wearing with this hat right now. I love it. I love it. Little I thought scarf. it was going to be like an aviator kind of a little cap. Like that would be Earhart. super appropriate. Uh, my bobby pins are caught on this. So there you go. Oh, it's stunning. So yeah, right. I just That's think great. it's so powerful. That's great. <laughs> so there we go. Oh, didn't mess up my hair too much. I love that. I just love it. You can tell I really like tweed yarns a lot too. Oh yes, I wanted to ask you about this yarn. Was there another tweed? I don't remember seeing tweed. Oh, this one, uh, the one before prior. Oh, that's also tweed. tweed. Uh. Yeah, my, I am, I love uh, Knit Picks again. Knit Picks City tweed is okay. so beautiful. Like the colors are gorgeous and vibrant. And it's such a soft yarn. It's one of those yarns that's maybe, it's so soft, you have to be careful with it. It will um, start to felt kind of easily. Mm -hmm. um, but, oh, it's gorgeous. It's so pretty. Highly People recommend People rave it. about Rowan felted tweed. I haven't tried it yet. But I hear a lot of buzz about that yarn, more than most yarns. Interesting. People seem to really... Uh, have a fondness for that. In fact, there's one podcast that I watch, Canadian um, Fleece and Harmony, and they stock every single colorway. I mean, I haven't really looked online, but there's dozens of colors, I think. It's like wow. a lot of colors, not just like 10 or 12. One of these days, I'm going to try it. <laughs> yeah I, I'm intrigued as well I always love any yarn I love it when it comes in tons of colors I just want all of the colors <laughs> choosing colors is really a challenge I find if you want it to look vintage and be true to vintage it's hard to know what the vintage colors really were so in an upcoming episode I did a little bit of research to try and find out. Ooh. I could I could spend my life researching. You know, that again, that's the science math kind of mind that you're willing to um, go the distance and keep looking and looking and looking and digging deeper. So yeah, in an upcoming episode, I'm gonna have some authentic things and you'll see some of the colors and some of the colors actually surprise you but I think you've done a, a nice job I think those very muted tones nothing bright nothing shocking um, is probably pretty authentic so thank you so much this thank has you. been so much fun I don't even want to say yeah. goodbye <laughs> <laughs> well I can come back anytime <laughs> Well, when you knit another handful of sweaters, Susan Crawford has a pattern that I would love to have. I just don't want to buy the whole book. You've probably seen this one. I think it's called something like Genie. 
it's got a very short sleeve and it has a lot of color work, but it looks very fine. It looks like it's from a zero needle maybe, Ooh. but it has a, like a sort of interesting neckline. And I think there's two like dress clips in the corner to make it sort of squared off instead of a V neck. And I someday would like to get my hands on that and maybe do that. But she's got a few different books. She does, yeah. I don't even. There's Stitch and Time one and Stitch and Time two, and yeah, yeah. And there's another one that's Vintage Knits, which has I had to buy that one just because I'm obsessed with the Christmas sweater that's in there. Um, gorgeous vintage Christmas sweater in that book, and there's Coronation Knits, and there's a whole bunch of more stuff in there. It's just so many books and so many patterns. <laughs> All right. Well, when you have a chance, send me snapshot of the close-up of this and anything else you think I should include and thank you what yeah. else can I say thank you very much enjoy the rest of your day and um for the rest of my viewers thank you yay <laughs> to Jesse um yeah see you next time Thanks so much, Billy. It was a, a real pleasure. Lots of Thank fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Can you see on your screen that it says recording? Yep, it has a little. Oh, good. Okay, so then you knew that I that I was honestly uh, not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead. So I forgot to show the closure for this sweater, but it's really cute. So actually, I cheated on this one. It's supposed to have a whole row of buttons, and then you're supposed to knit little button loops for each button. There's no built-in button holes in the pattern. Knit or crochet? Is it like a little chain cro of crochet? It doesn't even include instructions, so it's. Yeah, Do that's what you want. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I used one single pearl button and then I left a little keyhole opening. Um, and then there's this very vintage style one single button hole uh, actually made out of thread. Oh, like the button loop is made out of thread. Can you see that? Yes, perfectly. Great. Yeah, that was the, the, the closure for this sweater, which is, I love it. I think it's really cute. And I actually kind of like the little keyhole almost better than buttons all the way up. Or buttons all I the way up? How, how would you even button it? You would need somebody to do it for you, unless you buttoned them and then slipped it over your head, and then what's the point? Well, I couldn't. This thing is too tight. <laughs> There's right. No way. So just that one button is manageable. You can reach behind and do it. Yep, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, okay. Thanks for that extra little outtake. I'm <laughs> going to tack that on to the end. Excellent. All right. Thanks again. Yeah, no problem, Billy. Thank you.